Hi. Two weeks ago, or something like that, I came back from Greece. I go there uh, every little while over the last two years as a volunteer. This time I spend most of my time in Athens and on the islands of Samos. I'm working with refugees and migrants who are coming to Europe dreaming about this part of the world as a place where they will find the safety and where they will build a safe future without the war for their families. On the islands of Samos, there is a small camp with a capacity of about 700 people. Currently, at this moment, because people are still arriving, even the media in Europe are not talking about that, there is around 4,000 people in that camp. Around 3,000 are sleeping inside of the camp. The rest are on the hills around the camp. This morning, some children in European Union woke up in mud and sleeping on the ground because nobody gave them a safe place and a place to sleep because somebody decided to close the borders in, in the front of them. They dreamed about the Europe. They dreamed about Europe as a place where they will be good, where they will be safe. I lost that dream in 1992. I'm from Sarajevo. In uh, April 1992, 5th of April, I went to the punk rock concert. In the morning, my mother woke me up, telling me there is a war outside. I didn't want to believe her, so I continued sleeping. After probably half an hour or something more, I had to wake up. I had to get up. And I woke up in a completely different world. There was a war outside. There was a genocide outside. I survived the war, and I survived the genocide. In May 1992, on 28th of May, Ratko Mladic, the commander of the Army of Republika Srpska, who will hear his final judgment on 22nd of November this year, so after 15 years, order to his soldiers to shoot on Sarajevo, to use every available weapon they have and to burn down the city center. I used to live in a city center. The rocket fell on my balcony. I was with my parents in a living room. I was 16 years old. I was wounded that night. It took them six hours to bring me to a hospital that was only 10 minutes away from the place where I lived. Six hours because Ratko Mladic and his soldiers were shooting constantly. The city was burning. Everything around me was red. And I, wasn't, I didn't realize why everything is red. But it was because of the flames around my home and around my place where I lived. Finally, when I arrived to hospital, as I said, I was 16 years old, they put me in triage which means that they have to decide to whom to give priority. At that second, I was the youngest one in, the, in, the, in that hospital. Together with me, a woman arrived, a little bit older than I am, much, much heavily wounded than I was, but they decided to help to me first. Later, they helped her too. They put me in a room and her, like one next to each other, in a room full of people. It was more than 40 people in that room. The bombardment, the bombardment continued the whole day and the next day. We stayed there, and in the morning, uh, we, I managed to sleep. In the morning, I woke up with her body over mine because our beds were very close. She died. I survived. I continued living in Sarajevo until November the same year, when my parents decided to take me out. I was alone. They sent me out from Sarajevo with the last convoy that left the city, with the children and wounded people. I went to Croatia. That was the nearest country. And I knew some people there. I had a family there. And I felt it's OK to be in Croatia at that moment. I was alone, as I told you, unaccompanied minor, minor as they call it now. However, I felt that it's not a good place for me, and my family also told me that I should continue. And as many refugees today, I also try in Germany. In Germany, I understood how it is to be a refugee. That was the first time that somebody gave me a stamp written, a refugee. It was a humiliation. I felt like nobody. And I left Germany. I ran away back to Croatia. That was not safe, but I ran away there. It was not easy to move around even back then, because the borders were also closed for people who were looking for a safety. I went to Croatia after a couple of weeks. I was stopped on the street by a police officer. He asked me for my 
identification card, refugee identification card. When he read my name and surname in the city where I'm coming from, he told me, oh, you're a Muslim. Walk back to Turkey. He took my documents and he just ripped them off in the middle of the streets and he just left me there. Basically, I had to leave the country. I stayed for some more time because I couldn't, and I couldn't walk back to Turkey or anywhere. And why should I? So I stayed there. I lived uh, with a couple of friends. We were hiding most of the time. And then I managed to uh, find a way to get to Italy. In Italy, in Florence, one family adopted me. I stayed with them for some time, but I wanted to go back. I didn't want to be a refugee. I just didn't know how to be a refugee. The family I lived with, they never treated me as a refugee, but I still was a refugee. It's not good to be a refugee. You feel humiliated, you feel down all the time. You feel like an alien. It's just wrong. It's not good. And people feel sorry about you all the time. And nobody gives you really a chance because of what you are, but they just give you a chance because of the pity they feel toward you. And it's not. We are just people. We are the same as everybody, and we should have the same kind of chance, but we should have a chance. However, I managed, and that was totally crazy, to go back in the 1994 to Sarajevo, under the siege. I continue living under the siege for the next more than a year. In uh, November 1995, somebody decided that it's time to stop the war in my country. After three and a half years, after almost 100,000 dead people, after so many wounded people, after genocide and over the, then 20,000 uh, raped women in my country. So the European Union and the US and the international community decided, okay, it's enough. Now we will stop and we will let them continue their life. Since then I'm living in a post-war post country and it's not easy, it's still very bad. However, in uh, May 2015, I'm a journalist by profession. I decided to go to Serbia to see what is happening there because people were telling me about a lot of refugees and migrants coming. I went to, to Belgrade and what I saw I couldn't believe. The park where I, around the, the train station was covered <coughs> with people sleeping anywhere they could find a place because most of them were walking from Macedonia to Belgrade. They were exhausted. I tried to speak with some of them, they couldn't even lift their heads because they were totally, totally exhausted. They walked from Macedonia, it's a very long way. And they were exhausted of everything. And they were ready to continue toward their dreams, a dream of Europe. However, in March 2060, somebody decided to stop that dream and to close the borders. Today, thousands are in a limbo in Greece, in Serbia, in all over the Balkans. There are thousands of people who are sleeping in the cities of European Union, on the streets, in Calais, in France, in Italy, in Belgium, in UK, everywhere. There are just people who are dreaming about Europe, about the same Europe where you are living. They just want a chance for a normal life. And they don't have it because of the closed borders. Me and the army of volunteers from everywhere around the world, but mostly from Europe, are going and trying to help them, trying just to be there for them. I feel that I have to be close to them because I survived it. And I feel that if I'm around people who are coming in this way and who are running away from the war, I'm kind of like telling them, you can do it. It's okay, it will be difficult, but you can do it. You can make it, and that's why me as a war and genocide survivor, I think I have to be there and I think I have to be close to them. However, I think all of us have to find a way to help to other human beings because, as I told you, day before my war started, I went to rock and roll concert. I never even imagined that I will have to go through all this. So it can happen, unfortunately, to anybody. We have to find a way how to build the world and how to achieve the change that will stop the wars. But at the same time, before we do that, we have to think about how to create a Europe with no borders, how to open the borders, in order to open the borders, to show to the people who need our help, who need just friends, we need to open our minds, we need to open our eyes to look at the world we are living, and to open our hearts. And I think, it can help and I think it can be the first step toward the change, at least 
that's what I believe and that's what, how I'm trying to change the world around me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.